From the Encyclopedia Britannica, 11th edition, entry on Prussia. Prussian fire discipline. On approaching the enemy, the marching columns of Prussians wheeled in succession to the right or left, passed along the front of the enemy until the rear company had wheeled. Then the whole together wheeled into line facing the enemy. These movements brought the infantry into two long, well-closed lines. Parade ground precision obtained thanks to remorseless drilling. With this movement was bound up a fire discipline more extraordinary than any perfection of maneuver. Peloton Fuhr was opened at 200 paces from the enemy and continued up to 30 paces when the line fell on with the bayonet. The possibility of this combination of fire and movement was the work of Leopold, who by sheer drill made the soldier a machine capable of delivering, with flintlock muzzle-loading muskets, five volleys a minute. The special Prussian fire discipline gave an advantage of five shots to two against all opponents. The bayonet attack, if the rolling volleys had done their work, was merely presenting the check for payment, as a German writer put it. The particular utopia American believers chose to bring to the schoolhouse was Prussian. The seed that became American schooling 20th century style was planted in 1806, when Napoleon's amateur soldiers bested the professional soldiers of Prussia at the Battle of Jena. When your business is renting soldiers and employing diplomatic extortion under the threat of your soldiery, losing a battle like that is pretty serious. Something had to be done. The most important immediate reaction to Jena was an immortal speech, the Address to the German Nation, by philosopher Johann Fichte, one of the influential documents of modern history leading directly to the first workable compulsion schools in the West. Other times, other lands talked about schooling, but failed to deliver. Simple forced training for brief intervals and for narrow purposes was the best that had ever been managed. This time would be different. Under no uncertain terms, Fichte told Prussia the party was over children would have to be disciplined through a new form of universal conditioning. They could no longer be trusted to their parents. Look what Napoleon had done by banishing sentiment in the interests of nationalism. Through forced schooling, everyone would learn that work makes free, and working for the state, even laying down one's life to its commands, was the greatest freedom of all. Here in the genius of semantic redefinition lay the power to cloud men's minds, a power later packaged and sold by public relations pioneers Edward Bernays and Ivy Lee in the seed time of American for schooling. Prior to Fichter's challenge, any number of compulsion school proclamations had rolled off printing presses here and there. The problem was, earlier ventures were virtually unenforceable, roundly ignored by those who smelled mischief lurking behind fancy promises of free education. Russia was prepared to use bayonets on its own people as readily as it wielded them against others. So it's not at all that surprising that the human race got its first effective secular compulsion schooling out of Prussia in 1819. The same year Mary Shelley's Frankenstein, set in the darkness of far-off Germany, was published in England. Schuller came after more than a decade of deliberations, commissions, testimony, and debate. The Prussian mind had a clear idea of what centralized schooling should deliver. 1. Obedient soldiers to the army. 2. Obedient workers for mines, factories, and farms. Three well-subordinated civil servants trained in their function. Four, well-subordinated clerks for industry. Five, citizens who thought alike on most issues. And six, national uniformity in thought, word, and deed. The area of individual volition for commoners was severely foreclosed by Prussian psychological training procedures 
drawn from the experience of animal husbandry and equestrian training, and also taken from past military experience. Much later, in our own time, the techniques of these assorted crafts and sullen arts became discoveries in the pedagogical pseudoscience of psychological behaviorism. Russian schools delivered everything they promised. Every important matter could now be confidently worked out in advance by leading families and institutional heads because well-schooled masses would concur with a minimum of opposition. The tightly schooled consensus in Prussia eventually combined the kaleidoscope German principalities into a united Germany after a thousand years as a nation in fragments. What a surprise the world would soon get from this successful experiment in national centralization. Under Prussian state socialism, private industry surged, vaulting resource-poor Prussia up among the world leaders. Military success remained Prussia's touchstone, even before the school law went into full effect as an enhancer of state priorities. The Army Corps was the principal reason for Napoleon's defeat at Waterloo, its superb discipline allowing for a surprisingly successful return to combat after what seemed to be a crushing defeat at the little corporal's hands just days before. Unschooled, the Prussians were awesome. Conditioning in the classroom promised to make them even more formidable. The immense prestige earned from this triumph reverberated through an America not so lucky in its own recent fortunes of war a country humiliated by a shabby showing against the British in the War of 1812. Thirty years after Prussia made state schooling work, we borrowed the structure, style, and intention of those Germans for our own first compulsion schools. Traditional American school purpose, piety, good manners, basic intellectual tools, self-reliance, etc., was scrapped to make way for something different. Our historical destination of personal independence gave way slowly to Prussian purpose schooling, not because the American way lost in any competition of ideas, but because for the new commercial and manufacturing hierarchs, such a course made better economic sense. The private advance towards nationalized schooling in America was partially organized, although little had ever been written about it. Arrestus Brownson's journal identifies a covert national apparatus, to which Brownson briefly belonged, already in place in the decade after the War of 1812. One whose stated purpose was to Germanize America, beginning in those troubled neighborhoods where the urban poor huddled and where disorganized new immigrants made easy targets, according to Brownson. Emnity on the part of the old stock, middle class, and working class populations toward newer immigrants gave these unfortunates no appeal against the school sentence to which Massachusetts assigned them. They were in for a complete makeover, like it or not. Much of the story as it has been written by 1844, lies just under the surface of man's florid prose in his seventh annual report to the Boston School Committee. On a visit to Prussia the year before, he had been much impressed, so he said, with the ease by which Prussian calculations could determine precisely how many thinkers, problem solvers, and working stiffs the state would require over the coming decade. Then, how it offered the precise categories of training required to develop the percentages of human resource needed. All this was much fairer to man than England's repulsive Episcopal system, schooling based on social class. Prussia, he thought, was Republican in the desirable, manly, Roman sense. Massachusetts must take the same direction.
Prussia was a curious place, not an ordinary country unless you consider ordinary, a land which by 1776 required women to register each onset of their monthly menses with the police. North America had been interested in Prussian development since long before the American Revolution, its social controls being a favorite subject of discussion among Ben Franklin's exclusive private discussion group, the Junto. When the phony Prussian Baron von Steuben directed bayonet drills for the colonial army, interest rose even higher. Prussia was a place to watch, an experimental state totally synthetic like our own, having been assembled out of lands conquered in the Last Crusade. For a full century, Prussia acted as our mirror, showing elite America what we might become with discipline. In 1839, 13 years before the first successful school compulsion law was passed in the United States, a perpetual critic of Horace Mann's own political party, the Boston Whigs, charged that proposals to erect German-style teacher seminaries in this country were a thinly disguised attack on local and popular autonomy. The critic, Arrestus Brownson, allowed that state regulation of teaching licenses was a necessary preliminary only if school were intended to serve as a psychological control mechanism for the state and as a screen for a controlled economy. If that was the game truly afoot, said Brownson, it should be reckoned an act of treason. Where the whole tendency of education is to create obedience, Brownson said, all teachers must be pliant tools of government. Such a system of education is not inconsistent with the theory of Prussian society, but the thing is wholly inadmissible here. He further argued that according to our theory, the people are wiser than the government. Here, the people don't look to the government for light, but the government looks to the people. He concluded that to entrust government with the power of determining education which our children shall receive is entrusting the servant with the power of the master. The fundamental difference between the United States and Prussia has been overlooked by the Board of Education and its supporters. This same notion of German influence on American institutions occurred recently to a historian from Georgetown, Dr. Carol Quigley. Quigley's analysis of elements in German character, which were exported to us, occurs in his book, Tragedy and Hope, A History of the World in Our Time. Quigley traced what he called the German thirst for the coziness of a totalitarian way of life to the breakup of German tribes in the Great Migrations 1,500 years ago when pagan Germany finally transferred its loyalty to the even better totalitarian system of Diocletian in post-Constantine Rome, that system was soon shattered too, a second tragic loss for the security of the Germans. According to Quigley, they refused to accept this loss, and for the next 1,000 years, Germans made every effort to reconstruct the universal system from Charlemagne's Holy Roman Empire right up to the aftermath of Jena in 1806. During that 1,000-year interval, other nations of the West developed individual liberty as the ultimate center of society in its principal philosophical reality. But while Germany was dragged along in the same process, it was never convinced that individual sovereignty was the right way to organize society. Germans, said quickly, wanted the freedom from the need to make decisions. The negative freedom that comes from a universal totalitarian structure, which gives security and meaning to life. The German is most at home in military, ecclesiastical, or educational organizations, ill at ease with equality, democracy, individualism, or freedom. And this was the spirit that gave the West forced schooling in the early 19th century. So, spare a little patience while I tell you about Prussia and Prussianized Germany whose original mission was expressly religious, but in time became something else. 
During the 13th century, the Order of Teutonic Knights set about creating a new state of their own. After 50 turbulent years of combat, the Order successfully Christianized Prussia by the efficient method of exterminating the entire native population and replacing it with Germans. By 1281, the Order's hold on lands, once owned by the heathen Slavs, was secure. Then, something of vital importance to the future occurred. The system of administration selected to be set up over these territories was not one pattern on the customary European model of dispersed authority, but instead was built on the logic of Saracen, centralized administration, an Asiatic form first described by crusaders returned from the Holy Land. For an example of these modes of administration in conflict, we have the Herodotus account of the Persian attempt to force the pass at Thermopylae. Persia, with its huge bureaucratically subordinated army, arrayed against self-directed Leonidas and his 300 Spartans. This romantic image of personal initiative, however misleading, in conflict with a highly trained and specialized military bureaucracy, was passed down to 60 generations of citizens in Western lands as an inspiration and model but Prussia was now guided by a different inspiration. Between the 13th and 19th centuries, the Order of Teutonic Knights evolved by gradual stages into a highly efficient, secular civil service. In 1525, Albert of Brandenburg declared Prussia a secular kingdom. By the 18th century, under Frederick the Great, Prussia had become a major European power in spite of its striking material disadvantages. From 1740 onwards, it was feared throughout Europe for its large, well-equipped, and deadly standing army. The mature Prussian state structure was almost complete. During the reigns of Frederick I and his son Frederick II, Frederick the Great, the modern absolute state was fashioned there by means of immense sacrifices imposed on the citizenry to sustain permanent mobilization. The historian Thomas Macaulay wrote of Prussia during these years, the king carried on warfare as no European power ever had. He governed his own kingdom as he would a besieged town, not caring to what extent private property was destroyed or civil life suspended. The coin was debased, civil functionaries unpaid, but as long as means for destroying life remained, Frederick was determined to fight to the last. German writer and statesman Johann Wolfgang von Goethe said, Frederick saw Prussia as a concept the root cause of a process of abstraction, consisting of norms, attitudes, and characteristics which acquired a life of their own. It was a unique process, supra-individual, an attitude depersonalized, motivated only by the individual's duty to the state. Now today, it's easy for us to recognize Frederick as a systems theorist of genius, one with a real country to practice upon. Under Frederick William II, Frederick the Great's nephew and successor, from the end of the 18th century on into the 19th, Prussian citizens were deprived of all rights and privileges. Every existence was comprehensively subordinated to the purposes of the state, and in exchange, the state agreed to act as a good father, giving food, work and wages suited to the people's capacity, welfare for the poor and elderly, and of course, universal schooling. For children. The early 19th century saw Prussian state socialism arrive full-blown as the most dynamic force in world affairs, a powerful rival to industrial capitalism, with antagonism sensed but not yet clearly identified. It was the moment of schooling, never to surrender its grip on the throat of society once achieved. The devastating defeat by Napoleon at Jena triggered the so-called Prussian Reform Movement, a transformation which replaced cabinet rule by appointees of the national leader with rule by permanent civil servants and permanent government bureaus. Ask yourself which form of governance responds better to public opinion, and you will realize what a radical chapter in European affairs was opened.
The familiar three-tier system of education emerged in the Napoleonic era, one private tier, two government ones. At the top, one half of one percent of the students attended Akademienschulen, where, as future policymakers, they learned to think strategically and contextually. They learned complex processes and useful knowledge. They studied history, wrote copiously, argued often, read deeply, and mastered tasks of command. The next level, Realschulen, was intended mostly as a manufactory for the professional proletariat of engineers, architects, doctors, lawyers, career civil servants, and such other assistants as policy thinkers at times would require. From five to seven point five percent of all students attended these real schools, learning in a superficial fashion how to think in context, but mostly learning how to manage materials, men, and situations, how to be problem solvers. This group would also staff the various policing functions of the state, bringing order to the domain. Finally, at the bottom of the pile. A group between 92 and 94 percent of the population attended people's schools, where they learned obedience, cooperation, and correct attitudes, along with rudiments of literacy and official state myths of history. This universal system of compulsion schooling was up and running by 1819, and soon became the eighth wonder of the world, promising for a brief time, in spite of its exclusionary layered structure. Liberal education for all, but this early dream was soon abandoned. This particular utopia had a different target than human equality. It aimed instead for frictionless efficiency. I'm Army National Guard, so I serve two purposes instead of one. I go to Afghanistan, Iraq, and all that. I stay home. And we have an earthquake or something, or like 9/11 goes down. Guess what? They grab all of us. They pull us over there. We start with the rest of us. And uh, riots break out. The cops can't handle it. They call us. They go and help. We stop the other 16. So. Uh, Would you guys be interested in like getting an appointment with us? You know, come to learn more about it and、uh, no, see no. if it would be something to be interested in. Maybe I'll think about it.、Uh... All right, you guys have a good day. From its inception, Volkschulen, the people's place, heavily discounted reading. Reading produced dissatisfaction and offered too many windows into better lives, too much familiarity with better ways of thinking. It was a gift unwise to share with those permanently consigned to low station. Heinrich Pestalozzi, an odd Swiss-German school reformer, was producing at this time a non-literary, experience-based pedagogy, strong in music and industrial arts, which was attracting much favorable attention in Prussia. Here seemed a way to keep the poor happy without arousing in them hopes of dramatically changing the social order. Pestalozzi claimed the ability to mold the poor, to accept all of the efforts peculiar to their class. He offered them love in place of ambition by employing psychological means in the training of the young. Class warfare might be avoided. Information about this Prussian schooling was brought to America by a series of travelers' reports published in the early 19th century. First was the report of John Griscom. Whose book, A Year in Europe, highly praised the new Prussian schools. Pestalozzi came into the center of focus at about the same time through the letters of William Woodbridge to the American Journal of Education, letters which examined this strange man and his humane methods through friendly eyes. Another important chapter in this school buildup came from Henry Dwight, whose travels in North Germany praised the new quasi-religious teacher seminaries in Prussia. Where prospective teachers were screened for correct attitudes toward the state. The most influential, however, was the report of French philosopher Victor Cousin to the French government in 1831. This account by Cousin, France's Minister of Education, explained the administrative organization of Prussian education in depth, dwelling at length on the system of people's schools and its far-reaching implications for the economy and social order. 
Cousins' essay applauded Prussia for discovering ways to contain the danger of a frightening new social phenomenon, the industrial proletariat. So convincing was his presentation that within two years of its publication, French national schooling was drastically reorganized to meet Prussian, Volkschulen standards. French children could be stupefied just as easily as German ones. On Cousins' heels came yet another influential report praising Prussian discipline and Prussian results, this time by the bearer of a prominent American name, the famous Calvin Stowe, whose wife Harriet Beecher Stowe, the conscience of the abolition movement, was author of its sacred text, Uncle Tom's Cabin. Calvin Stowe's report to the Ohio legislature attesting to Prussian superiority was widely distributed across the country. The Ohio group mailing out tens of thousands of copies in the legislatures of Massachusetts, Michigan, Pennsylvania, North Carolina, and Virginia, each reprinting and distributing the document. The third major testimonial to Prussian schooling came in the form of Horace Mann's seventh report to the Boston School Committee in 1843. Mann's sixth report had been a peon to phrenology, the science of reading head bumps, which Mann argued was the only proper basis for curriculum design. The seventh report ranked Prussia first of all nations in schooling, England last. Pestalozzi's psychologically grounded form of pedagogy was specifically singled out for praise in each of the three influential reports ever cited, as was the resolutely non-intellectual subject matter of Prussian Volkschule. Also praised were mild Pestalozzian discipline, grouping by age, multiple layers of supervision, and selective training for teachers. Mann wrote, there are many things there which we should do well to imitate. Mann's report strongly recommended radical changes in reading instruction from the traditional alphabet system, which had made America literate, to Prussia's hieroglyphic style technique. In a surprising way, this brought Mann's report to general public attention because a group of Boston schoolmasters attacked his conclusions about the efficacy of the new reading method and a lively newspaper debate followed. Throughout 19th century Prussia, its new form of education seemed to make that warlike nation prosper materially and militarily, while German science, philosophy, and military success seduced the whole world thousands of prominent young Americans made the pilgrimage to Germany to study in its network of research universities, places where teaching and learning were always subordinate to investigations done on behalf of business and the state. Returning home with the coveted German PhD, those so degreed became university presidents and department heads, took over private industrial research bureaus, government offices, and the administrative professions. The men they subsequently hired for responsibility were those who found it morally agreeable to offer obeisance to the Prussian outlook, too. In this leveraged fashion, the gradual takeover of American mental life managed itself. For a century here, Germany seemed to be at the center of everything civilized. Nothing was so esoteric or commonplace that it couldn't benefit from the application of German scientific procedure. When the spirit of Prussian Pelton Fuhr crushed France in the Lightning War of 1871, the world's attention focused attently on this hypnotic utopian place. What could be seen to happen there was an impressive demonstration that endless production flowed from a Baconian liaison between government, the academic mind, and industry. Credit for Prussian success was widely attributed to its form of schooling. What lay far from casual view was the religious vision of a completely systematic universe which animated this Frankenstein nation.
administrative utopias are a peculiar kind of dreaming by those in power, driven by an urge to arrange the lives of others, organizing them for production, combat, or detention. The operating principles of administrative utopia are hierarchy, discipline, regimentation, strict order, rational planning, a geometrical environment, a production line, a cell block, and a form of welfareism. Government schools and some private schools pass such parameters with flying colors. In one sense, administrative utopias are laboratories for exploring the technology of subjection and as such belong to a precise subdivision of pornographic art, total surveillance, and total control of the helpless. The aim and mode of administrative utopia is to bestow order and assistance on an unwilling population, to provide its clothing and food, to schedule it. In a masterpiece of cosmic misjudgment, the phrenologist George Combe wrote Horace Mann on November 14, 1843. The Prussian and Saxon governments, by means of their schools and their just laws and rational public administration, are doing a good deal to bring their people into a rational and moral condition. It is pretty obvious to thinking men that a few years more of this cultivation will lead to the development of free institutions in Germany. When Johnny comes marching home again, hurrah, hurrah, we'll give him a hearty welcome then, hurrah, hurrah. Earlier that year, on May 21st, 1843, Mann had written to Combe, I want to find out what are the results as well as the workings of the famous Prussian system. Just three years earlier, with the election of Marcus Morton as governor of Massachusetts, a serious challenge had been presented to Mann and his board of education and the heir of Prussianism surrounding it and its manufacturer politician friends. A House committee was directed to look into the new Board of Education and its plan to undertake a teacher's college with $10,000 put up by industrialist Edmund Dwight. Four days after its assignment, the majority reported a bill to kill the board, discontinue the normal school experiment, it said, and give Dwight his money back. If the board has any actual power, it is a dangerous power touching directly upon the rights and duties of the legislature. If it has no power, why continue its existence at an annual expense to the Commonwealth? But the House Committee did more. It warned explicitly that this board really wanted to install a Prussian system of education in Massachusetts to put a monopoly of power in a few hands, contrary to every aspect of the true spirit of our democratical institutions. The vote of the House on this was the single greatest victory of man's political career. A 32-vote swing might have given us a much different 20th century than the one we saw. Man arrived in Prussia when its schools were closed for vacation. He toured empty classrooms, spoke with authorities, interviewed vacationing schoolmasters, and read piles of dusty official reports. Yet from this non-experience, he claimed to come away with a strong sense of the professional competence of Prussian teachers, all admirably qualified and full of animation. His wife, Mary of the famous Peabody's, wrote home, We have not seen a teacher with a book in his hand in all of Prussia, no, not one. This wasn't surprising, for they hardly saw teachers at all. Equally impressive, he wrote, was the wonderful obedience of children. These German kinder had innate respect for superior years. The German teacher corps, the finest collection of men I have ever seen, full of intelligence, dignity, benevolence, kindness, and bearing. Never, says man, did he witness an instance of harshness and severity. All is kind, encouraging, animated, sympathizing. On the basis of imagining this miraculous vision of exactly the Prussia he wanted to see, man made a special plea for changes in the teaching of reading. He criticized the standard American practice of beginning with the alphabet and moving to syllables, urging his readers to consider the superior merit of teaching entire words from the beginning. I am satisfied, he said, our greatest error in teaching lies in beginning with the alphabet. The heart of man's most famous report to the Boston School Committee, the legendary seventh, 
rings a familiar theme in American affairs. It seems even then we were falling behind, this time behind the Prussians in education. In order to catch up, it was mandatory to create a professional core of teachers and a systematic curriculum, just as the Prussians had. Mann fervently implored the board to accept his prescription, while there was still time. The note of hysteria is a drum roll sounding throughout Mann's entire career. Together with the vilification of his opponents, it constitutes much of Mann's spiritual signature. That fall, the Association of Masters of the Boston Public Schools published its 150-page rebuttal of Mann's report. It attacked the normal school's proposal as a vehicle for propaganda for Mann's hotbed theories in which the projectors have disregarded experience and observation. It belittled his advocacy of phrenology and charged Mann with attempting to excite the prejudices of the ignorant. The second attack was against the teacher-centered non-book presentations of Prussian classrooms, insisting the psychological result of these was to break student potential for forming the habit of independent and individual effort. The third attack was against the word method in teaching reading and in defense of the traditional alphabet method. Lastly, it attacked man's belief that interest was a better motivator to learning than discipline. Duty should come first and pleasure should grow out of the discharge of it. Thus was framed a profound conflict between the old world of the Puritans and the new psychological strategy of the Germans. Sixty years later, amid a well-coordinated attempt on the part of industrialists and financiers to transfer power over money and interest rates from elected representatives of the American people to a Federal Reserve of centralized private banking interests, George Reynolds, president of the American Bankers Association, rose before an audience on September 13, 1909, to declare himself flatly in favor of a central bank modeled after the German Reichsbank. As he spoke, the schools of the United States were being forcibly rebuilt on Prussian lines. On September 14, 1909, in Boston, the President of the United States, William Howard Taft, instructed the country that it should take up seriously the problem of establishing a centralized bank on the German model. As the Wall Street Journal put it, an important step in the education of Americans would soon be taken to translate the realm of theory into practical politics, in pedagogy, as well as finance. Dramatic, symbolic evidence of what was working deep in the bowels of the school institution surfaced in 1935. At the University of Chicago's Experimental High School, the head of the Social Science Department, Howard C. Hill, published an inspirational textbook, The Life and Work of the Citizen. It is decorated throughout with the fasces, symbol of the fascist movement, an emblem binding government and corporation together as one entity. Mussolini had arrived in America. The fasces are strange hybridized images, one might almost say Americanized. The bundle of sticks wrapped around a two-headed axe, the classic Italian fascist image, had been decisively altered. Now the sticks are wrapped around a sword. They appear on the spine of this high school text, on the decorative page introducing part one, again on a similar page for part two, and are repeated on part three and part four as well. There are also fierce military eagles hovering above those pages. The strangest decoration of all is on the title page, a weird interlock of hands and wrists which, with only a few slight alterations of its structural members, would be a living swastika. The legend announces it as representing the united strength of law, order, science, and the trades. Where the strength of America had traditionally been located in our First Amendment guarantee of argument, now the Prussian connection was shifting the locus of attention in school to cooperation with both working and professional classes, sandwiched between the watchful eye of law and order. Prussia had entrenched itself deep into the bowels of American institutional schooling.